Hi everyone, welcome back to uh, Wednesday Worship at Cromer Church. It's uh, first Wednesday the 1st of April and great to have you with us as we uh, listen to God in his word and we seek him in prayer. Uh, I want to start this morning by reading uh, from Psalm 62, which is one of the uh, psalms from the lectionary uh, for today. Let me read. The psalmist says, My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our salvation and our rock and our fortress. Thank you that when everything else uh, seems uh, to be shaken, uh, you alone are unchanging and we can find our rest and our hope in you. So help us now as we come to your word uh, to uh, listen to you, to hear your voice and to find rest in you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, why don't you uh, open it and turn with me to uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 20. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. And I want to read and look at verse uh, 29. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, we see here um, from Matthew. Matthew says, As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy upon us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. And this truly is the word of the Lord. Uh, one of the best ad campaigns in recent years has been that one that's been uh, run by the Specsavers chain of uh, opticians. Uh, you'll definitely have seen it. Uh, each advert focuses on somebody mistaking someone or something else uh, for something else, uh, usually with embarrassing results. Uh, and it always ends with the final line, should have gone to spec savers, should have gone to spec savers. Uh, seeing things properly uh, matters in our everyday life, of course. Uh, if we can't see properly, uh, we'll have accidents and bump into things and uh, life will be one long tale of embarrassing incidents. Uh, it matters in our everyday, but it really matters uh, when it comes to eternity and our spiritual lives. Uh, Matthew's Gospel is written to help us to see clearly, uh, to see Jesus clearly, to see who he is and uh, why he came. And that whole question of who Jesus is and why he came gets more and more urgent uh, as Matthew's Gospel uh, starts to draw to a close. And we're in those stages uh, now as uh, we get to this story. I think in this little brief uh, incident here with these uh, men and the crowd, he just shows us three things about King Jesus that I want us to see. And he's encouraging us uh, to think through what it might mean for us to see Jesus clearly uh, and to see him properly. Uh, what are these three things? Well, uh, let me draw them out for us. Uh, the first thing we see here is that Jesus was a popular king. Uh, Jesus was a popular king. Uh, Jesus heads out of Jericho. Uh, for the very last time on his way to Jerusalem, uh, to his death and uh, his resurrection. Uh, and Matthew tells for us that as he did so, a large crowd uh, followed him. Now, there's nothing especially unusual about that. Jesus has always been uh, somebody who uh, arouses interest and attracts uh, followers. But the reasons that people have for following him can vary enormously. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us here exactly why these crowds were choosing to follow Jesus. But based on what we've seen elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel and elsewhere, we can probably make some intelligent guesses. Uh, right from the start of his ministry, Jesus had attracted people on the basis uh, of his miracles. Uh, people always enjoy a bit of a show uh, and seeing Jesus at work had attracted uh, attention uh, to him. Now, for some people, those miracles, I guess, were just a source of uh, entertainment, something to uh, pass the time by. 
But for others, uh, they were encouragement to see Jesus as somebody who could meet uh, their needs. Uh, some of that was healing. Uh, some of that, of course, was other things. Uh, when uh, Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, you might remember that uh, story. Uh, it's told in uh, John chapter 6. John records for us at the end that there were many people who thought that uh, by providing bread for them, uh, Jesus could uh, somehow mean that they never had to work again. If they followed him, then he was the answer to their physical needs. Some people followed Jesus because they thought he'd meet their needs. Uh, some people, though, uh, clearly thought Jesus uh, was the answer to the political crisis they were facing. Remember at this time, uh, Israel was under, or Palestine was under occupation of the Romans. Uh, the Jews hated the Romans. They wanted them uh, to be got rid of. And they were looking forward to a political leader, a military leader, who could come along, uh, throw out the Romans, and bring back the good old days uh, that they uh, thought that they uh, should be enjoying. Some people thought he was a political leader. Other people, it seems, followed him out of personal ambition. Uh, if you were with us last week, last Wednesday, uh, you'll remember we looked at that little story of uh, two of the disciples, James and John, uh, seeking uh, status and position at the hands of Jesus. Uh, no doubt there were many people who followed Jesus because they uh, thought that in him uh, they would find fulfilment of uh, ambition and status. Now, maybe all those things are understandable. But ultimately, if we're following Jesus simply from selfish motives or for self-centred reasons, then we've never really, I guess, understood why he came at all. And I think from what Matthew says, that seems to be a problem with this crowd. Uh, we're told, aren't we, that as the cavalcade moved out of the city, uh, they were met uh, by two uh, blind men, blind beggars, uh, who were sitting uh, by the roadside. Uh, men who were desperate to meet with Jesus and to talk with him. Now, if the crowd had really understood who Jesus was and why he'd come, surely they would have welcomed him and welcomed these men. They would have done everything they could to uh, make sure these men had a chance to encounter Jesus. After all, if he'd healed them, then why couldn't he heal these men? Uh, if he changed their lives, then he could change these men's lives as well. But they didn't. Instead, we're told uh, they rebuked them and tried to shut them up. They told them to be quiet. They could not see that Jesus had come for people like these. Uh, maybe there's a challenge in those verses for us uh, this morning. It is all too easy, isn't it, to come to Jesus purely for selfish reasons, uh, to expect him to meet our needs, whatever those needs uh, might be, uh, rather than to listen to him and see what he wants to do for us, we come to him with a list of uh, demands that we want him uh, to, uh, to, to meet for us. Uh, regardless of whether that's what we really need or whether he's come to bring that. Uh, we can get frustrated when it seems like he's not giving us the attention that we think he ought to. Uh, perhaps we can be frustrated when it seems as though other people are receiving his attention or uh, receiving uh, answer to their needs, uh, the needs that we want him to meet. Well, the crowd tried to block the beggars, but fortunately for them, there's a second thing that we see in this passage. And it's that Jesus wasn't just a popular king, he was a pitying king as well, a pitying king. Now, presumably, the crowd thought that Jesus was going to agree with them and tell these men to, to clear off, to, to get lost, to go and mind their own business. But far from it. Uh, we're told instead Jesus stopped and called to them. He took pity uh, on them. Uh, literally, it reads in the original that Jesus was deeply moved with compassion. Something in these men really stirred inside him. He saw their plight and he loved them. Now, it's not really the attitude uh, or the response that you would expect from uh, somebody who is a king or a VIP or a celebrity. Uh, most celebrities, as far as I can uh, see, uh, seem to live in a bit of a world of their own. They're surrounded by their minders and they're only interested in people who are like them or uh, people who can uh, perhaps offer them a bit more of a leg up or a bit more influence. But that's not the way of Jesus. As we've been seeing in Matthew's Gospel, and we saw that in our passage last week, uh, the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Uh, the first are last and the last are first. Uh, Jesus isn't so much interested in the powerful and the mighty as much as he's interested in the least and the lost. He's interested in people like these two men. He's interested in people like you 
and people like me. Now that is good news, isn't it? Uh, I meet lots of people uh, as a vicar and have often have conversations with them about God and very often the conversation goes something like this. Uh, well, vicar, I can never be good enough for God uh, or God would never be interested in somebody uh, like me. It's a common enough uh, statement to make, it's a common enough uh, understanding, but it's a misunderstanding because this passage tells us that he is. He is precisely interested in people who don't think that he should be interested in them. Now, to be sure, of course, by rights, he shouldn't be interested in us. The Bible explains that by rights, none of us have treated him in the way that he deserves. Jesus has come to be the king and none of us want him to be the king of our lives. We've pushed him out and pushed him to the margins. He would be well within his rights to ignore us and to push us to the margins as well. But he doesn't. He reaches out in mercy. It's a mercy we can't explain. It's a mercy we don't deserve. But he takes pity on us. Jesus is a pitying king. But lastly in this passage we see that he's also a powerful king as well. A powerful king. It's one thing, isn't it, to feel some sympathy for somebody, but it's quite another thing to be able to do something about it. Uh, it's easy to see someone's plight and, and want to intervene, but in effect be powerless. And maybe you've had that sense as you've been watching and reading uh, some of the news in the last couple of weeks about the spread of coronavirus. Uh, we want to do something, but we just don't feel able to. We feel so powerless, uh, stuck in our situation. Well, wonderfully, Matthew shows us that Jesus isn't just a king who has pity on us, but he's a king who's powerful as well. His mercy is demonstrated, if you like, not just in his attitude, but in his actions as well. Verse 32, we're told that he asked the men, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Now, it's interesting to compare that question with the question that we saw him asking uh, last week. That question that he asked at the mother of James and John in the previous section, verse 21, if you've got your Bible open in front of you. Uh, it's effectively uh, the same question, uh, but it's a question that answers a different request, and it's actually a question that issues in a different response from the Lord Jesus. Why? Well, it depends on the attitude and the, uh, and the demand uh, that the people make, isn't it? Uh, the brothers uh, who came to Jesus in our last week's passage were seeking status. Uh, these men weren't seeking status, they were seeking their sight. Uh, they came humbly, uh, not believing that they deserved anything from Jesus at all. And Jesus gladly uh, granted uh, their desire. Uh, we're told, verse uh, 34, uh, Jesus touched uh, their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and they followed him. Jesus brought them that healing that they longed for. That's a wonderful picture of physical healing. But it's also a picture, isn't it, wonderfully, of what he does for us. Uh, Paul tells us in the letter to the Ephesians, that God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that ye have been saved. Uh, we might not be physically blind, but all of us are spiritually blind until God takes the blinders off, until he uh, removes the scales, till he opens our eyes to the wonders of who he is and who we are and what he's done for us. By ourselves, we can't do anything to change our situation. But in Christ, through his death on the cross, he has done everything. He's opened our eyes to the truth of who he is. He's made us whole. He's healed us through the cross. And all we have to do is to do as these men did, to cry out to him, to reach out to him, to seek him and ask him to do what we know we can never do for ourselves. Well, right at the end of this encounter, the encounter the men have with Jesus, uh, we're told that these men followed Jesus. Uh, Jesus, I think, had done more for them than simply open their eyes. He'd open their eyes to the truth of who he really is. He's the king, the king who's come to save his people and to reign in their hearts and lives, to transform us, uh, to, uh, to, to give us the life uh, that we've uh, longed for. And in return, these men became his loyal subjects. They decided to follow him 
and to uh, walk in his ways. There's a great hymn, isn't there, that you'll all definitely know that we often sing in church, the great hymn Amazing Grace, written by uh, the former slave captain John Newton. It has the, uh, the wonderful lines, I once was blind, but now I see. Uh, that's a testimony that every Christian can say. I once was blind, but now I see. And as I close, I want to ask you whether that's uh, something that you could say and something you could sing this morning. Has Jesus opened your eyes? Opened your eyes to the truth of who he is? Opened your eyes to the truth of why he came and, and what he wants to do for you? Well, may our prayer be the prayer of these men in this story. Lord, we want to see. Lord, let our eyes be opened. We're going to uh, pray now. Again, we're going to pray using um, the Cromer Church uh, prayer diary uh, that we have. Uh, I'm using the one on our Prayer Mate um, app. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the example of these two men. Thank you for their persistence in prayer. They wouldn't be put off uh, from uh, coming to you. Thank you for their faith. Thank you that they saw that you were who you said you were. You were the king who could transform their lives and come and rule and reign in their hearts. And thank you that they followed you. Lord, help us, we pray, to see you clearly for who you really are. And we ask you to remove the scales from our eyes and help us to follow you faithfully and to reach out to you just as they did. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as Easter approaches, uh, we're aware that it's a strange time for uh, all of us. Our usual preparations uh, are not what they would be. Uh, it's a time of confusion, both for us as individuals, but for us as a church family as well. Help us, we pray, nonetheless, to put you at the centre of our lives in this time. We pray that this uh, space that we have and this time to be still would be a time for us to recenter our lives on you, to reflect again on why you came and what that means for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for our government officials and our decision makers uh, in our land and elsewhere who are seeking to lead us in this time of crisis. Uh, your word tells us that they have been appointed uh, for this time and we pray for them. Pray that they would mobilise resources effectively and quickly. Give them wisdom to see where they're most needed. Uh, we pray for all those who are working uh, behind the scenes in all sorts of different ways. Uh, give them strength, give them encouragement, we ask. Uh, and we pray that you would use their efforts to combat the spread of coronavirus and to respond to it uh, worldwide. The Bible tells us to seek the peace and the prosperity of the city that we are in. And Lord, we seek our peace and prosperity for our town of Cramer here that we live in. We pray, Lord, your blessing on our town and all who live within it. Pray, Lord, for your protection over us, that you would uh, stop the spread of the virus among us. We thank you, Lord, for volunteers in our uh, town, in our community, who have stepped up to help others. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would use them to uh, meet needs. We pray, Lord, in this crisis that many people would be caused to turn to you, uh, to turn back to you, uh, to seek your refuge and your protection and your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's draw our prayers together by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. We pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us again. It's been great to have you with us. A reminder, of course, uh, that we uh, gather again online uh, on Sunday at 10.30. We really hope that you can uh, join us on this YouTube channel. 
Uh, but for now, I uh, pray that you stay safe and the Lord's blessing goes with you. Let's close by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.